Hello and welcome to Shoot the Breeze, where we take a nostalgic look at a random football magazine from the past. I'm Andy Smith, aka Scott's Footy Cards on Twitter, and with me is Tom Brogan. Hello. In each episode, we'll invite a special guest to join us in trawling through the magazine and discuss anything contained within it. This could be anything from an article, to a photograph, to a competition, to an advert. Basically, if it's in it, then we'll talk about it. So sit back and let's shoot the breeze. Wriggles clear. Might just get the chip and he does. He scores! Oh, what a great back Uh, this week we're joined by the former Dunfermline Celtic and Scotland player Jackie McNamara. Jackie, thanks for coming along. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you very much for joining us, Jackie. We've picked out a shoot magazine for yourself um, from the 21st of November 1981. So before we go into it, uh, would you have got shoot magazines, match magazines when you were a wee boy? Yep, yep, although I don't think I remember, <laughs> I remember <laughs> much about it, but yeah, I would have had, uh, uh, between that and the, uh, the sticker albums and mm. stuff, try to get, try to get uh, uh, doublers of my dad when he was playing. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see if we can um, refresh some of your memory. There is a wee article on your dad in here as well, so we'll have a wee check at that later on. So we'll go to the front page. The front cover is a photograph of Ke- Kevin Keegan with his arm raised in triumph and a smile on his face. And he's wearing a Hungary shirt. England had just beaten Hungary 3-1 in Budapest in June earlier in the year in their World Cup qualifying group. And they were due to meet them again at Wembley in the last game of the group, which this is just before that. So the magazine is a World Cup special and the main photo has a heading, England can do it, Keegan says. And it's accompanied by the Espana 82 logo, a red and yellow Spanish flag with a football over one end. And inside there are expert views from Ron Greenwood, Danny McGrain, Martin O'Neill and Brian Flynn Shook take a look at the home nation's chances of qualification. There's also a Man City team group in the centre pages and the cover price is a uh, measly 25 pence. It's 57 cents in Australia, 55 cents in New Zealand, 1,200 lira in Italy and 11 krona in Denmark. Uh, so... Look, just looking at the the front page, it's a cracking Hungary strip. That it's an Adidas one, a red Adidas, um, with a, an embroidered badge in the middle. Now, for me, actually, I don't know how well you can see, it, but Kevin Keegan looks a bit like Richard Hammond to me there, the from Top Gear, and the picture was actually used. You remember the the song, the England World Cup song, uh, this time? Do you remember that song, the Ron Greenwood? Uh, this time, more than any other time, this time. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. this this was the picture that was used for the for the album of that, but obviously they they them um, drawn them in as an England with with an England shot. So anything we want to pick out from the front cover there? Anything that grabs your attention? As if you remember that game, I'm sure that game was on live. It was, yeah. Because uh, I, I remember that was when Trevor Bruton scored and the ball stuck in the stanchion. Right. I don't yeah. you remember that. I remember, I remember watching that game. Yeah, it was a midweek game, and it was unusual for midweek games to be live on the TV at that point. But yeah, let's, let's jump inside. So on to page two, and I'm going to pick out the shoot view. So the title is World Cup Thriller. So this is a little editorial by shoot. And shoot compares the suspense of the qualifying ties with the TV show Dallas from producing The Unexpected. And on Scotland, they say, the only certainty in a year of climax and anticlimax is that Scotland will achieve a hat trick of World Cup appearances. It's fairly predictable that Scotland will not make the same mistakes which marred their last World Cup campaign. The Scotland squad is crammed with talent when international football is allegedly short of quality players. Now, if only that was true. eh? So they're obviously talking about the 1978 uh, debacle that went on there and saying that we wouldn't make those same mistakes again. Which was true, we made different mistakes, didn't we? Yeah, absolutely. Um, There's quite a few to to mention as well. (laughs) You're obviously one of the last players to have played in a World Cup for Scotland, Jackie. But what was what was the experience like being part of that squad? It was brilliant. Um, I think just being involved in the you know the, in the games and the Tatton Army. Uh, obviously, my my family there, my dad and brothers and uncles, and you know, part of me was was uh, thinking I'd love to be with them, but okay. obviously, <laughs> professionally, you know, you'd rather be involved in the games and. Uh, 
you know, that they were, they were brilliant to be involved in. Is that something that you, you actually think about a bit? That sometimes when you're playing, you miss not being in amongst the fans? Is that something that, that comes up quite well? Well, even just this magazine there, I actually, we travelled to the Spain in 82. My dad and my, you know, we were at the Scotland game in the, against Brazil. You know, obviously very young at the time, but, you know, it was great memories going around and, and to think I actually played in a World Cup, you know, it was, and being involved with the national team at like that. And obviously, it's been a long time since we've we've uh, qualified. It was good we were been involved in the Euros in the summer there. But you know, for me as a, a young boy going to watch him with my dad and my brothers uh, in Spain in '82 uh, to be playing in the World Cup was was special. What well, what what would be your apart from the World Cup that you actually took part in? Then let's just um, just soak that in. You actually took part in the World Cup. What what one was your favourite World Cup as a spectator? Would it have been '82? It would have been yeah. I mm. think it just. Uh, you know, being a, a young lad and, and seeing all the players and, uh, you know, the Brazil, the Brazil game, being at that game especially, yeah. uh, when Mary scored that unbelievable goal and we upset them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but the goals are there and, you know, it's the first being up close and live to the Brazil team with, you know, Zico's and the players they had was just incredible. Mm. Uh, you know, as a young kid, obviously you see bits on the TV, but when you're actually at a game live, uh, it seems it seems really special. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's my my favourite as well, and it's just everything about it. It was a beautiful summer, and obviously, if you're over in Spain, it was going to be hot anyway. But it just it seemed magical. It seemed, you know, that that's not been I've not really encountered that in any World Cup. And we talk about this. Maybe it's it's that golden age, from about ten, twelve years, between eight and twelve years old. That, that the World Cup that you experience at that point becomes your favourite one, and that for me eighty two, nothing nothing beats it. What about you, Tom? Yeah, it's eighty two for me. Yeah, eighty two. Yeah, I was, my, was my, I was ten, so it was, that was my first World Cup, sitting in front of the telly watching every game. Mm. Start, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's take a wee look at pages two and three. So this this is um so the shooter looking at the upcoming qualifier at Wembley between England and Hungary. So as the front cover suggested, England manager Ron Greenwood admits that the famous Hungarian side of the nineteen fifties had a great influence on his footballing philosophy. This was this was the last game of the group and England were sitting in third spot behind Hungary and Romania, although Romania had finished their games and were a point ahead of England but with an inferior goal difference. So a win or a draw would see them go through against Hungary and as it was, England won 1-0 with a Paul Mariner goal in front of 92,000 fans at Wembley. Now th- this this was the tournament, this was the very tournament that the, the famous Norway um, 2-1 game, the, you know, you've taken a hell of a beating sort of one, so that, that was that tournament and see, I'd, I'd remember that at the time and it, I, I don't equate it to this tournament, I just... You know, it's, it just seemed like something that happened, and I, I don't remember it being that far back. Um, so the Hungary game, as you say, Tom, it was shown on BBC um, during the midweek, and this was the first World Cup that England had reached since 1970 as well. So they made it with the skin of their teeth, I think. Let's let's say that. Um, moving on to pages six and seven. So should take a look at the Northern Ireland versus Israel in Belfast and also the Portugal versus Scotland game in Lisbon. We'll look at them separately. So the first one, Northern Ireland are in third place in Scotland's group and are a point behind Sweden who have played all their games. Now the Northern Irish have a better goal difference and only need to draw to qualify. So Shooter speaking to Martin O'Neill who's photographed there, there's a picture of him in there, who insists we'll do it if we keep cool. He says that they will rely on the experienced players in the squad to show the others how to cope with the game and even though they have not been scoring many goals, O'Neill doesn't expect that we need to score many to get the result they need. So as a wee spoiler, Northern Ireland beat Israel 1-0 thanks to a Jerry Armstrong goal. Um, across the page, shoot also used a chance to preview his Portugal versus Scotland game as the basis of this week's Tartan Talk with Danny McGrain, which I don't know if you remember, that it was a, a feature in the magazine and other um, Andy Gray used to do it um, Ali Dawson used to do it so there's there quite a lot of different Scottish players who would do the Tartan Talk but the Danny McGrain ones were always good for um, he used to have a wee wind up with English and things like that and he was quite forthright so th- those were quite good so Danny, Danny starts off by talking about the fact that he's had to pull out the Scotland squad due to fracturing his leg in a recent match against Partick Thistle 
He missed the Northern Ireland game and while back in training, sees no need to rush things for the Portugal game, given the fact that Scotland have already qualified. He does mention Ray Stewart in the article who came in and replaced him in that Northern Ireland game, saying that he did a marvellous job. And he also picks out Asa Hartford who took over the captaincy role from him, saying that he, he doesn't receive the credit he deserves playing for Scotland. And lastly, he, Danny pays tribute to Johnny Doyle, the Celtic player who had sadly died in a recent tragic accident at his home. And about Johnny, Danny says, I don't think I've ever known a player more dedicated to one club. He never hid his love for Celtic, even when he played for Air United. And if he hadn't been wearing a green and white hoop jersey, I know he would have been wearing a green and white scarf on the Parkhead terraces. Uh, so, as a spoiler, Portugal won that game 2-1, thanks to Emmanuel Fernandes' double. And the Scotland goal was by Paul Sturrock. So, I'm, I'm guessing you, you would know Danny McGrain quite well, Jackie? Yeah, yeah, he's a uh, great guy. Um, I was fortunate enough, he was in the coaching setup a couple of times as well in my, in my 10 years there. But and what a player he was, what mm-hmm. a defender, you know, he, he's one of the best. Um, but a good relationship uh, with Danny, you know, and uh, see him now and again. And he's, he's quite a funny character as well, good sense of humour. Yeah. So, what, what about yeah. the. Sorry, Tom. I was just going to ask. I think well, you were going to ask there a picture of Martin O'Neill sort of cool on the ball. So, what was what was Martin O'Neill like to to play under? Uh, I mean, it was a fantastic uh, time for the for the club when he came in. He transformed things right away. Um, it was quite it was quite difficult to get uh, close to him or know where you stood with him. You know, and uh, I wouldn't say aloof, but he was quite distant. Um, and I watched a documentary years later after I'd been with him and was in uh, Clough and there's a lot of similarities and you take a lot of things from, from Clough um, and he was his manager. But I really liked him, you know, I thought he was I thought he was an excellent, really intelligent man. Um, you know, and when he spoke, you, you listened, people listened to him and he could control a room. Um, but no, he was good. He was a good footballer as well. Yeah. Uh, he's good as a pundit as well. He's very, very forthright. As a pundit, but yeah, like you say, obviously it was an exciting, must have been an exciting time for you at Celtic when you when you came in. It was, yeah. I mean, the, um, John Barnes had just left, and Kenny took the team, uh, who was my hero growing up, uh, Doug Leash, yeah. uh, took the team to the end of the season, and done well. We won the we won the league cup with Kenny, and then uh, Martin came in, uh, you know, pre season, and you know, changed things really quickly. Brought some in some great players for us. But uh, trans transformed the club at that stage. Yeah, but uh, as well as bringing in a lot of guys, he he, he didn't he sweep everybody out kind of thing. He kept you know because it was obviously guys there that had been signed by Tommy Burns and signed by Doctor Joe and signed by Rim Jansen kind of thing. He obviously knew the talent that was in that was already there. Yeah, and I think um, he improved players by you know the way he went about things. Um, you know, guys like you thought um, wouldn't have a, a career with him. Um, probably myself included. You know, when he first came in, I, I was in his starting eleven, then lost my, my position. Guys like Bobby Peter, Stillian Petrov, you know, he, he transformed Stillian um, and helped him in his career. So, yeah, it wasn't just the ones that he brought in. He, he had a, a good way about him with, with, with players and to get the best out of him. So just on, on the Tartan Talk page at the bottom there, I don't know if you can see it, there's also a photograph of Alan Brazil in action. And yeah. It's not the most felt he I've looks, seen him as a footballer. As well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've I've seen quite a lot of photographs where he's you know he's he's never small, but you know he was yeah. he was athletic. But yeah, he certainly looks to be on the way the way um, the way out at that point in time. Great player though, great player. Yeah, he was. Okay, let's move on to going to move on to this advert. So here's a wee blast from the past here. So Butel, page ten. So this one says, the right moves could take you to the 1982 World Cup in Spain. So this is a competition competition by Sabutil. And the page is a half-page photo of a superbly set-up Sabutil scene, complete with stadium, crowd and floodlights. The action shows the ball already in the net. So somebody's just scored with a number, number of players set up through the half and in the penalty area. So the competition itself is titled Plot the Shot. And it has the following rules. The scene that's set from an actual goal from the 1978 World Cup. So they're all set up in the positions of an actual goal from the 1978 World Cup. One team is in dark and one is in white. 
In the competition form, there's an overhead diagram of the setup as well. Um, and the, the players that are attacking are identified by letters. I hope this all makes sense. It's your job to identify which three players were involved in the move and goal and in which sequence it happened. Um, I was speaking to Tom about this earlier on. I have no idea which goal that is. Um, I've, I've, I've been through one of these YouTube videos that shows the entire set of 1978 goals and nothing, nothing matched with that. So either I wasn't paying attention or... Yeah, and it just uh, missed me by. Um, now, the prize, brilliant prize. Air travel for two with 15 nights hotel accommodation and tickets for eight matches plus the final. And it's open to everyone under 17. Did you have Sabuto, Jackie? Is that, was that something that was in the household at the time? Yeah, it was, yeah. I did, uh, actually liked, I liked that. Um also had another game called Striker. I yeah. remember that. We used to press the wee head and the, the, the footman come out and kick the ball. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I think uh, Shibuto stood the test of time. You know, when the floodlights come out in the stadiums and mm. it was uh, a bit different from the, the games the kids have now <laughs> with FIFA. And yeah. Stuff. But it was brilliant. Yeah, it's it, it certainly more interactive. And for me... The joy was in the setup of it. It was never actually playing the game for for me personally. Was was where the joy was it in the setup of it, and then it was a case of, right, okay. But I don't think we had any, the stadium and things like that, which was always the dream. And we spoke about this before about how, the, the floodlights for me were the the worst. I I I always say that the floodlights actually sucked light in rather than giving it out. They were that bad. Um, they used to take those big batteries. And they would last for about two minutes, and that was them gone. So, I don't know what your experience was at the floodlights, but mine was quite, um, quite emotional and quite a heartbreaking thing. You must have been well off uh, the floodlights as well. <laughs> uh, Santa was good to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so so the, I mean, great competition as we said with the prize. Tra air travel for two to the World Cup, two weeks accommodation, tickets for eight games plus the final. I mean. I would love to find out who won that, so maybe that's something for us to do later on. Okay, let's have a wee move on to pages 12 and 13 here. So this is quite a colourful couple of pages, and it's looking at the, the home country games, apart from Scotland. So there's reviewing of the Hungary-England game coming up, and we'll, we'll look at that first. There's a double-page spread. The, the first page shows Paul Mariner leaping above a Hungarian player to win a header, the next show is Brian Robson with a bit of a perm going on and he's leaving the Hungarian fl player in his wake. The last one shows Steve Koppel. I don't know if he's um, got over that challenge or he's been brought down. I suggest by his right leg there, his right foot, he's probably been caught with that. And looking at the boots, so we've got a pair of Pumas for Paul Mariner. We've got Adidas for Brian Robson and I'm going to get this one right, Tom. Patrick. For Steve Koppel. Yeah, Steve Koppel. Yeah. What, what kind of boots did you wear when you were when you were younger, Jackie? My first boots were um, Puma Dudley Silver, right. uh, in the, the golds, uh, and I had a pair of Patricks as well. Uh, Kevin Keegan wore them yeah. as well. I also Adidas. I did Adidas ones as well. As as I got older, uh, Copas mm. first came out as well. Yeah, I take it. I take it as as you started to play professionally that you no longer bought your own boots would that be the case uh, yeah that's I think it was it was until I got I was at Celtic yeah. I started getting uh, the, the boot deals and stuff um, it was Reebok to start with I was wearing Reebok and then I had a, a contract with uh, Fila right uh, yeah what were they what were the boots like were they comfortable enough or the Reebok, aye, uh, Reebok ones were really nice. Aye, uh, uh, Reebok Integrity, they were called. Right. Um, with the 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 sign, the white came right round the back of the boots, and uh, you know, and the and they made sure that they never put the the black polish over the white bits. I like to have the white bits shown, and yeah, like yeah. they were new all the time. Um, it's one of my pet hates when the you know when the you used to shine the boots up for your pros or that, and you. Just go right over the, the white bits as Adidas or Pumas and, mm. and discolour it. 
Yeah, they became grey after after that. Yeah, yeah. For me, it would be like a um, couple of weeks worth of maybe just making sure you don't go over the edges, and then after that, so I would have been one that annoyed you. So apologies and apologies. And uh, I just used dubbing just to get the dubbing out. Hmm. That was always decent for the leather and kept other bits white as well. Yeah. So just look at again, looking at the strip. I mean, we've we'll, we'll just briefly spoke about the Hungarian one that Kevin Keegan was on the front, but for me the. The Spanish, the English kit there is the, um, it's the d -d 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 Admiral, Admiral one with the yeah. the blue stripe and the red stripe at the top. For me, personally, as a, as a Scotland fan, that that's my favourite England kit of all time, and, and it may again come back to the nineteen eighty two thing. So, what, what would what about yourself? Do you have a favourite England kit? Um, I wouldn't say it's favourite, but <laughs> I think oh. out, out of them all, I I'd probably go with that one as well. Mm. Probably. Their, their best looking one, iconic one. Yeah. Um, between that one and the the World Cup in ninety. Yeah. In Italy. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's have a look across the page. So we've got the Republic of Ireland team here. Um. So this this photograph was taken. It's a team photo, and it was taken before the France game where the Irish won three two in Dublin the previous month. Now the Irish kit is by O'Neill's, and we've spoke about this before. And I don't know if you know the story of this. O'Neill's is, is an Irish based kit manufacturer and it's basically three stripes so it's the same as Adidas and Adidas took them to court in 1983 so a couple of years after this and lost which I love so O'Neill's can use the three stripes but only in the Republic so they can't they can't do it in Europe um, which is an, a nice wee nice wee story there but it's a, it's, a, it's a nice enough little kit isn't it? Yeah yeah I like that, I like that. Um, it's, uh, it's smart yeah. Really smart. Few few well well known well the mostly well known faces in there as well. You got Liam Brady, um, Michael Robinson yep. in there, Frank Stapleton, Matt Lawrence, who there's a focus on feature at the back of this magazine. Um yeah, quite a few in there. Would you have worked with anybody that's in the the, the picture there? Um just trying to think. No, no, I haven't. Yeah. I, I just seen the lad, the previous one with, with Terry McDermott, he was there. Right. The last the picture before, yeah. I worked with Terry. He was there under the John Barnes era, but uh, one, I think the one before that was it. Yeah, he's in the celebration picture there. Yeah, yeah, he's there. Yeah, yeah, he's there. The Tash. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah what with, with Terry then and John Brent, uh, Barnes era. But obviously, I know uh, O'Leary uh, a few times. That was a good, a good side as well. Yeah. So the the other photograph on this page is action from the Wales versus Iceland game at home with the Drew 2-2 and the Welsh kit is another cracker for me another Adidas one, it's a red body with uh, white arms, a bit sort of Arsenal type uh, white shorts with the thick red band down the sides and red socks so yeah that's another for me icon I, that sort of period for me was the best for, for football kits so you know I, I'm going to say every time a kit comes up that's an iconic one so there we go. Um, let's move on to page 15. So that, since we're talking about boots, I don't know, did you have a goal at all? Or would that have been? You know what? I'd actually, I was at a, 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 a kind of fancy dress um, <laughs> about a month ago. I went in, there's a, a retro shop near where I live and they were, I actually bought a pair of white Gola uh, sort of trainers with yeah. green uh, old retro to wear to this sort of 70s event it's actually quite smart <laughs> whereas <laughs> back then you, I would have been seen dead in them uh, yeah. whereas now I think they're quite smart yeah. but um, the boots themselves you know they weren't very popular it was more the, the branded there when I was a little boy uh, yeah so, so for me the boots are there the only ones that look remotely comfortable are the ones in the bottom middle the euro cups which are probably the most expensive ones as well everything else looks a bit sort of plasticky and a bit solid um the ones in the middle are the roy races so that those are the ones that you know that you would know you know i think that they were yellow the stripes are yellow on on that one um red studs maybe as well um but those are the ones that probably why gola was so well known for young kids at the time, but um, I, I never had a pair of those. And they're endorsed by Emlyn Hughes with, there's a photograph at the top, so they couldn't even get a photograph of them with the boots. 
So I don't know what sort of endorsement that is. Um, okay, let's move on. So we're at pages. There we go, pages sixteen and seventeen. So this is news desk. So there's there's a lots of little stories from from around the country and stuff here. So I'm going to pick some of them out. First one, uh, Cesspod. So Cesspod, Bradford City's West Indies-born defender, became the first black player to reach 400 league appearances with one club last month. Now he would go on to make 502 league appearances for City and 565 in all competitions, which is still a club record, so he holds the appearances record for that. He signed for Halifax Town and played another 57 games, and then he played with Scarborough, where he won promotion with them under manager Neil Warnock. He played for and later managed at international level of St Kitts and Nevis. So that's Cess Pod there. Is that is that a name that you you know at all, Jackie? No. No, no does it ring a bell? No. No. Okay. Sorry, that one. No problem. Gibson's back is the next little article and Aidan Gibson, an eighteen year old winger with Derby, is keen to make his mark this season after some atrocious luck last term. He broke his ankle after only a minute of being on the field in his debut against Shrewsbury and played on for a further 20 minutes without knowing. He's looking for a bit more luck in his future, it says. Now, as a spoiler, unfortunately, luck didn't shine on him, as he broke his other ankle a couple of years later, before moving on to Exeter, where he'd only make 18 appearances. So, a very short career there, cut by injury. Next one, falling attendances. So, a time when attendances are falling at many football grounds in Scotland, the amateur game is booming. More and more people are playing amateur football these days and this growth in popularity has led to the launch of the Scottish Amateur Football Association Lottery. The scheme will generate funds for the association throughout Scotland. Next one, Peter Marinello. Um, the new George Best is what, he's called, what he was called. And it says, Statements such as that heralded the arrival of the young Scottish star when he signed for Arsenal a decade ago. Unhappily, Marinello never fulfilled his ambition. He moved again just recently from American club Phoenix Inferno to Hearts for £30,000. Peter Marinello, um, I mean, he started at Hibs, but that would have been before your dad was at Hibs, wouldn't it? Um, was it yeah, I, I recognise the name, though. I've heard, that, heard, heard of him. Um, yeah. I don't know a lot about him, Yeah, I do recognise the name. Well, he started at Hibs, went to Arsenal, and as I say, was um, touted as a new George Best. He was actually even he actually even um, introduced a top of the pops, I believe. Is that right, Tom? Wasn't it? <laughs> okay. He was he was like the this new um, trendy guy and good, really good looking boy he was as well, um, but never really worked out from there. Portsmouth then came back up to Motherwell, um, sometime over in the states. Hearts uh, finished at Party Thistle, really. Um, you know, I think I think it's fair to say he's one of these people who didn't have the career that everybody thought he was going to have. Have you anything to add to that, Tom? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I just just like, like you say, I sort of remember him being sort of, or the story of him being sort of touted as a, the new big thing, and it never mm. quite worked out for him. I would say if you ever get the chance, Jackie, um, on YouTube, look out for the top of the pops one because it's is he's not comfortable doing it. <laughs> he's, he's, he's surrounded by these lovely lovely girls and stuff yeah. like that but you can see it's, he's not in his comfort zone yeah, with comfort it. Zone, yeah. uh, so next one I'm going to look at is um, Celtic's new book it says Celtic's glorious history is illustrated vividly in a new book entitled Celtic FC Facts and Figures 1888 to 1981 that's quite a catchy title isn't it um, it costs £1 and is available from the club shop Research was carried out by Pat Woods with a tribute from Chairman Mr Desmond White who says it will undoubtedly become, with our other books, an important part of Celtic history. So it's available on eBay, if you like, for £12.99. So I don't know if you you, you have a copy of that or if that's anything you've 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 seen in the, the Celtic shop or anything like that. But um, yeah, as I say, Celtic facts and figures, 1888 to 1981. So while we're while we're on Celtic there, Jackie. So I, I firm, how long did it take you to make your mind up when Celtic came in for you? Uh, not long, to be honest. Um, okay. You know, I was talking about that earlier today. Because um, I think they put a bid in first, and then it was rejected. And obviously, we were told that the uh, firm wanted a million pound for me at the time, which I thought was mental, uh, considering we were in the champ, the elite first division at the time. Um, and we spoke to the club, me and my dad, and it was before obviously Bosman, and, yeah. and 
I got a call later on that uh, that day to say that they accepted it. I think it was six fifty plus add-ons for Scotland. So it worked out seven hundred uh, on my first Scotland cap. So yeah, it was, and it was it was a, the just as uh, Braveheart came out of the cinema, and uh, me and my wife lived in the family at the time, and we were in the cinema to watch the film, and I'm probably the only one that didn't get. Uh, hyped up or emotional watching Braveheart. Uh, I was just so excited about you know the next morning I was going through to to send for Celtic and do my medical. Mm. So. Well, listen, we're going to. I've got a little article from a later shoot magazine. We'll have. A, I'll just go forward to that because it's sort of related to this. Um, mm-hmm. So this is from um, shoot nineteen ninety five November, and it's looking at the Celtic kids coming of age. And there's a little bit here for yourself. And it says, uh, Tommy Burns paid 600, 650,000 for the right back. He's tracked for ages. And the new boy admits, just getting here is a thrill. It's been my dream to play for Celtic. I was so, exci- so excited after my debut that I slept with my Celtic shirt on. Is this correct? Yeah. Yeah. I did. And uh, the, the kit man gave me the, the shirt. And he, as you can see in the, sh- the, the picture there, <laughs> this is before you had your own name in the back and your own size. So this is a XL, but... And it was like a nighty on me. We, <laughs> you'd see it's uh, rolled up there. And while I was actually in the signing and uh, doing my medical, uh, someone broke into my dad's car oh. and stole my boots. So um, I was nervous enough to make my debut because I signed that day. It was the fourth of October, hmm. and we were done the done the everything there, done the medical, signed, and the gaffer Tommy Burns was like, "I'm going to start you tonight." Uh, it broke for against Falkirk. Are you, are you ready? I mean, yeah, of course, yeah, brilliant. So went out to to get my stuff at my dad's car, um, which was just parked. Remember the old pylons in the in the car park at Celtic Park. My my dad's car was parked there, and someone had smashed the window and took my boots and my shit pads. So um, I was nervous enough, but I had to borrow someone's boots and shin pads to play that night. Um, I was so nervous. Yeah. Okay, let's move back to where we were. There's a few. Yep. So we've looked at the Celtic book. So the next one is titled Alex's Jackpot. This is about Alex Ferguson. It says Aberdeen manager Alex Ferguson won't forget his scouting trip to the Mer- to Merseyside earlier in the season to take in the Everton versus Notts County game. When the home side striker Peter Easto opened the scoring in the fifth minute, Ferguson checked the golden goal ticket he'd bought for the game and found out he was the winner of a £250 jackpot. He did just everything he does turns to gold as Alex Ferguson. Um, what, what, what's your, your... Let's talk about Alex Ferguson. What, what's your experiences with, with Alex? Uh, yeah, when I was a kid, um, there was a few of us, seven of us went down to Man U in trial. Um, he used to bring all the kids from different areas of the UK. The ones, you know, like... Alan Johnston, Brian McLaughlin, Tommy Harrison. We went down there, seven of us. We had, at the time, there was Ryan Giggs, obviously, and different other ones. Beckham was a wee bit younger, but he was there. And we stayed in this kind of halls of residence. So I went down, went down for a week, and I got invited back the following year. But as everybody started to grow, I, I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't invited back uh, later on. Um, but it was for me, it was a great experience. And... There was some unbelievable players there, boys that uh, you remember their names, obviously, because they've, they made it into my news team, but also guys like Nick Barnby was there, uh, who went to Tottenham at the time, and obviously a few of the Scottish lads that uh, went up to play against, um, you know, in the back of that. As I said, Alan Johnston, me, Brian McLaughlin, Tommy Harrison was Colin McKee, who actually signed. He uh, signed Colin McKee and played in the first team there, Scottish lad. So it was, yeah, that was my, and meeting him at the time was, was fantastic. Obviously, I've met him a few other times since then with the football and being at Celtic and testimonials uh, we're playing against Man U. And uh, when I took ill last year, we both had a, kind of similar injuries where, you know, with, uh, brain hemorrhage. So uh, I actually watched your documentary recently and it was, a lot of things I could relate to. It's uh, quite quite emotional. Mm. How how how's, how is your health at the moment? Yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, 
feel totally fine. And as I said, obviously there's a lot of changes to <laughs> the way things are, but I think um, you know how how you can recover. You know, and that's the thing with the documentary. He was worried about his his memory and writing things down. And I was quite similar at the start. Mm. Um, you know, I couldn't remember anything a couple of minutes ago. Uh, it was quite tough to, but it's amazing how how the brain can recover and how you can heal again. Yeah. No, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear you're, you're doing well. That that's great. So, um, moving on to the next one, Scottish flyer aids Cardiff. So Cardiff City have enlisted the help of Olympic sprint champion Alan Wells. Wells and his wife Margot, also a runner, gave advice on speed training. Now, I don't know if you, do you remember Alan Wells, the the Scottish runner. He won the yeah. 100 gold 100 meters, wasn't it, and the silver in the 200 meters. This was the Moscow Olympics 1980. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And I think, mm-hmm. um, not not wanting to take away from his achievement, that was the one that the, the US didn't, they boycotted Yeah, they uh, boycotted it, yeah. Listen, I, I, was, I think I was talking to my mum about this the other day and just said, listen, you can only beat what's in front of you. So if um, all, the, all the really good ones don't turn up, you know, what, what are you going to do? It's Alan Wells. Um, Heart for Hearts, um, Heart striker Derek O'Connor looks like tying up his future with the Ed- Edinburgh side. He's re-established himself in the first team after an unsettled spell and he's back amongst the goal scorers. He's also happily withdrawn his transfer request. Um, is that a name you remember, Derek O'Connor? No, no, yeah. I don't. He, well, he, he started at East Fife, St Johnson, Hearts. After that, he went to Dunfermline. He was there for a the year, 84-85. Uh, Brecon City, Berwick Rangers, and then um, Brock, Broxburn and Pennycook. So he, he made a fair few appearances for, for Hearts, 127 league games, 47 goals. Um, and he scored, I think, on his debut, he scored um, a goal in the first minute um, and a win away to Aberdeen. Um, so, you know, I think that you're, you're setting the bar high, aren't you? Scoring a goal in the first minute of your debut against Aberdeen. So I, yeah. don't, I don't think he really. I mean, he's done okay, but you know, if, if it's not a name that I really remember much either. But yourself, Tom, Derek O'Connor. I remember. I think he's got a hard to get Clyde Bank. Yeah. Well, we better tell Jackie that Tom, Tom, and I are Clyde Bank, both Clyde Bank supporters. So that anything, right. anything we always look mm-hmm. at with a Clyde Bank slant as well. So we all try to uh, shoehorn Clyde Bank into anything we can. Yeah, the. Privilege of playing there as well at Clyde Bank um, against, against the great David Cooper. Yeah, um, yeah. Right, it was it was uh, they were good games actually. And a tough tough place to go. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. you know, it's it's, it's a bit, um, more, I guess, morbid. But I mean, David Cooper obviously had the brain hemorrhage as well, and that went. Yeah. You know. I know why like, he wasn't as as fortunate and um, lucky as myself at that. You know, and that's. You know, I spoke about that before, and um, when when I heard, obviously, um, I knew that, that that's how he passed away, and it was mm. similar. I was a bit more fortunate that uh, there was people in the area and paramedics close by, and so no, nah, but he was uh, he was a special player, David. Mm. Even as he got older and yeah. started to wind down a bit, and I was sort of starting my career. I was lucky enough to play against him, and he was he was good. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking, um, we had uh, Kennedy on, who's a Clyde Bank striker, and he was talking about David Cooper at that period as well, and just saying he was the best player he'd ever played with. You know, he still he still had it. Um, mm-hmm. Which, you know, I, I think there was a lot of people who thought when he moved from Rangers, that was the end of his career, but he went to Motherwell, won the cup, and just, you know, he still still had plenty in, in, in the tank. Um, Okay, next one. I think this may be the last one of these these letters. I know these letters, these um, little snippets. is about Ted McDougall. Um, so Ted, whose career took him to Liverpool, York City, Bournemouth twice, Man United, West Ham, Norwich, Southampton and Blackpool, is considering a comeback at the age of 34. He said, talk with San Jose Earthquakes, George Best's current club, and Southern League club Salisbury. He says, I'm just as fit now as when I played in the first division. So as a spoiler, he would he wouldn't go to the US. He actually went to Salisbury, and then he had a spell in Greece and Australia, and I believe he's currently coaching the Atlanta Silverbacks in the states. Um, very good goal scorer was Ted McDougall. 
and you know some great clubs there as well Liverpool Bournemouth Man United um, West Ham Norwich City um, as I say and he had obviously a, a spell at York City which you, you had a spell there yourself um, yeah I think his might have been more um, <laughs> more favourable to me <laughs> yeah <laughs> I had a spell I was, I was there but I think he would, I think they would uh, appreciate him a lot more than I did me at, mm. at that club that's for sure well, what what do you take away from the, the York City experience? Uh, not great. Um, <laughs> no, I think it, I think in life experiences are good and bad, but they they are what they are. You know, mm. the football side has been good, and most of the management was good. But um, the positives there, obviously, was was probably meeting the chairman, who I'm still from friends with uh, to this day. You know, we, we got in so well and. He stood by me and he believed in me, mm. which was feeling this was a was a tough a tough job to, yeah. to take over. And it's I think over the years it's been a bit of a, a graveyard for managers. Um, you know, and I can understand why. Yeah. Know, it's been it's a, it's a tough gig. Okay. Well, well, that 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 will be our only mention of York City then, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's uh, have a look at the next page that we're going to look at, which is. We're going to look at on the ball with Justin Fashion now. So this this is quite a this is quite a um, quite a sobering article. Um, so the heading is Black Power is getting stronger. So that's um, so Justin tells of being in the plunge bath after a game when he starts to scrub his leg. He shrieks, "I can't feel my leg; it's gone numb." And it turns out that it was someone that else's leg that he was washing. Uh, it happened after turning out in a testimonial match with Cess Pod, who we mentioned earlier of Bradford City, and the bath was shared with 10 other black players. Justin tells this anecdote to highlight a remarkable change taking place in league football, the black explosion, they call it here. He tells of his excitement at the number of black players breaking through in the game. They've even set up a representative all-black team, the one that appeared in the Cess Pod testimonial, and also in another testimonial for Jim Cannon at Crystal Palace. Justin goes through the players involved and picks out some of the lesser known ones such as Chris White, Raphael Mead and Watford's John Barnes who he says, I'm told the boys got class. Yeah, didn't he just? Now Justin says that there are no racial tensions in the game and he says, and th this is a quote from him and I have a message for the commentators who criticise fans for making jungle noises whenever black players get the ball. Don't worry about it lads, we love the chance. If the crowds are shouting abuse, we know we are playing well enough to rile them. We don't find it offensive. As long as blacks can play sport together with whites, there are no racial problems in this country. Gentle ribbing between white and black harms no one. Now, when I, when I first saw this article and read that, I, I, I couldn't, it, it really was quite sobering and it, it sort of slapped, you know, it was like getting slapped in the face to, to hear that. Um, if, you know, if I read it back and think maybe he's being, you know, sort of um, sarcastic, then it would make perfect sense. But maybe, maybe he was just maybe that was his way of dealing with it and um, just try to t take the sting out of things. But yeah, I, I, I personally, I don't agree with it. But I'm, I'm never going to criticize a black player or a black play person for you know have an opinion on how they're treated because you know you can't put your, yourself in those shoes but um yeah it was quite a sobering thought but he, he mentions um so a few players chris white who went on to was it Leeds united he played in united, arsenal yeah. mm -hmm. um rafael mead who turned up at dundee united i believe is that right yeah. mm -hmm. and obviously john barnes who at the time was at watford but he was the one coming through um so what what, what was your what was your experience, uh, John Barnes, when when you played there? Um, I, th I think you know when when we first got announced, I was absolutely buzzing. I thought this is going to be brilliant because obviously watching him, he was a fantastic footballer, and you know that Liverpool team. I thought this is going to be total football. We're going to going to love it. But um, I'm kind of disappointed a wee bit with with some of the with the you know uh, some of the things that kind of went on, and obviously. The biggest thing was Henrik breaking his leg, made it really difficult for him. But I think he's certain things that I thought he struggled with um, at the start, you know, with some of the players we had in the dressing room. 
um, just how he, he went about it. But um, there's no doubt he was an unbelievable player. But I just think his his man management wasn't wasn't the, wasn't his best mm. um, asset. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's the same thing, and I know we say we wouldn't t- touch on the York City thing again, but you know, it just shows you that it's you know you you don't have a divine right to to make a management position work. You know, it's yeah. like you know you can put the best people in these situations, and it just not be the right person in in that situation. You know, so um, yeah, it was definitely definitely a, a, a cracking player. Um, so just down on. So Justin Fashion and when I was looking at it, I was actually I can't believe I didn't know this that his real name is just Justinus or Justinus, I guess it is. But um so I'm just gonna quickly um roll off the teams that he's played for. Norwich City, Adelaide City, Nottingham Forest, Southampton, Notts County, Brighton Hove, Los Angeles Heat, Edmonton Brick Men, Man City, West Ham, Leighton Orient, Hamilton Steelers, South Hall, Toronto Blizzard, Leatherhead, Newcastle United, Torquay, Airdrie, Chelburg, Heart of Midlothian. Atlanta Ruckus and Miramar Rangers. So he's obviously somebody who moved about quite a bit there. And, and you know, I would say probably literally half of those teams I have never heard before in my life either. But while, while at Hearts, um, 90, would you, you, you have played against them? 93, 94? Yeah, he was uh, at I don't see if he actually played in the match, but yeah, he was there and at Airdrie as well when I was yeah. at the family. Yeah. Been there. Um, and it's funny one of the teams there, Leatherhead, which is uh, my uncle's played. We're based down there, down in London. Uh, they, they were around Leatherhead, so is I that, that, them. Is that a, a non-league team down there? Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. I've never heard of Leatherhead, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, he was um, apparently his contract at Hearts was terminated for unprofessional conduct, um, where he attempted to sell false stories about him and some cabinet members. Uh, ministers to the press, I can't, I can't say I remember that being um, what the reason was, but yeah, certainly a colourful, excuse the part, a colourful um, figure, and you know controversy certainly um, came with that as well. I think. Okay, let's move on a couple of pages here, and so this one is Qatar not to be sneezed at, um, and it says Qatar were a sensation at the World Youth Cup in Australia eventually losing out in the final to West Germany. On the way, they beat Poland 1-0, Brazil 3-2 and England 2-1. The Qataris had switched to Brazilian coaches from England's English ones as they said the English ones were teaching their boys to run at 100 miles per hour in the desert heat. Stories suggest that the youth players each received a new car for their efforts at the World Cup. The coach was on £120,000 per year, tax-free, plus a free apartment and servants. And the article finishes with... Watch the Arabs rise to soccer power in the years to come. So the, let's take a last bit. That that didn't happen. The the Arabian teams haven't risen to soccer power. Um, but let's let's take a look at a free car for the for the youth internationalists. One hundred twenty thousand pound a week back in nineteen eighty. Uh, no, a week a year back in nineteen eighty one. Tax free, free apartment and servants. That's not a bad job if you can get it. Eh? Yeah, I wonder what that'd be worth now. What did it, yeah, I'd say that I'd still take one hundred and twenty thousand pound a year just now. It's a good salary now. I mean, back then, mm. um, that's in the car as well. Yeah. yeah. So is it is that the is the Middle East it's something that's ever happened for you in terms? Of, has that ever been an option to go to play there or go to manage or anything like that? Has there ever been any? No, yeah. no, it's never really appealed to me that. Um, I think the closest I've, I came to to leaving the UK was to go to Australia right. uh, before I went to Aberdeen. Um, I had a chance to go to it was Sydney FC, mm-hmm. uh, and the manager got sacked before I agreed to it. So <laughs> maybe a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Um, I'm not I'm not the best flyer, um, so you know, it's, it's quite a quite a journey. Mm. Okay, let's, we're at the centre page, so we'll, we'll have a quick look at this Man City team group and then we'll, we'll pop out and have a wee chat with you about the book and things. Um, so the centre spe- spread, as I say, is Man City team group and it's an old blue umbro kit with white piping down the shoulders. And there's a few Scots in there um, that I can recognise. Tommy Hutchinson, um, Bobby McDonald, Jerry Gow. Um, I think those are the only three there that... Uh, well, there's, there's Asa Hartford, but I'll talk about that in a wee second. So what they've done at the bottom of the page, whoever had this magazine previously, um, 
they've added some panini stickers of players who've obviously um, joined after this photo was taken. So we've got Asa Hartford, John Ryan, Ian Davies, David Cross, Chris Jones and Graham Baker. And so they've cut out their panini stickers and stuck it in the bottom. I, I quite like, occasionally I'll see that on the magazines where, where people have done that and I quite like that as a use of it. You, you spoke earlier on saying that you collected the panini stickers. So, you know, you're always going to have doublers. So what are you going to do with them? And I think that's a good, um, as good way as any. And just also I pick out Trevor Francis is there and uh, Martin O'Neill is up, there, there, yes. up mm-hmm. the top at the back yeah. Um Anybody else who want to pick out Paul Power in the middle bottom who we had on the podcast as well? There's um, Dennis Stewart, bottom right there, um, second one in. Joe Corrigan, Tommy Caton, there's, there's quite a few in there. Okay, so that's the team group and we'll move out of the magazine for a wee bit and we're just going to do a wee, quickly do a focus on, so you'll know of the focus on features that you get in the magazine where it's a player and they ask all these questions. So we're going to do a focus on yourself, Jackie, so I'm going to throw some questions at you. And don't worry, there's nothing There's nothing loaded in these, they're just standard <laughs> right. questions. Um, first question, full name? Jack McNamara, yep. Birthplace? Glasgow. Okay, what was your first car? My first car was a uh, Volkswagen Polo. Which colour? Silver. Who's your favourite player of all time? You've mentioned him. Of all time? Uh, well, as I said, as a kid, it was, it was Kenny Douglas. Who's your favourite team? Um, well, it was mostly when... I would say growing up, it was whoever my dad was playing for at the time. So um, I was a bit young mm-hmm. to be uh, Celtic when he was there. It was mostly Hibs up until he moved. And then he went to Morton. And I spelled it actually a short spell at Hamilton as well. And then I mean, watched watch McMorton. Mm-hmm. So I was my dad's team, whoever that was at. So I was supporting at the time. And okay. obviously later on, it's, it's always been Celtic. Okay. What's the most memorable match? So either that you've watched or you've been involved in. Most memorable match, yeah. I think personally, you know, um, would be scoring the cup final against Hibs um, in uh, Martin O'Neill's first season. Um, yeah, I, I think personal reasons. You know, when I was a kid at Hibs and they'd been too small uh, and let and let go, and obviously Dunfermline took me on, so. For me, it was a bit of, a bit of payback for, for letting me go. Okay, next question. What's been your biggest thrill in your life? Uh, biggest thrill? I don't know if I've never scored in the cup final again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's, 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 yeah, we'll go <laughs> for that. I'm supposed to say the cough to my kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, only if you want to. Only if you want to. Okay, yeah. on, on the flip side, what's been, <laughs> what's been your biggest disappointment? Uh, I would say uh, probably losing the league. In the last day of the season, away at Motherwell. Between that, I mean, the, obviously using, losing the UEFA Cup final in Seville was was tough. But I had a lot of personal stuff going on. My mum wasn't well at the time as well, so it wasn't it wasn't as uh, as bad in, in, in that in my memory. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Because I had other issues at yeah. the time. Okay, what's the best country that you visited? Best country, uh, you know, probably the Cayman Islands. Okay. Favourite food? Chinese. Okay. What's your favourite TV show? Favourite TV show? Uh, it was Fools and Horses. Okay. Oh, Fools and Horses. That's quite yeah. a popular one throughout the Focus On features. So. Um, favourite singers? So give us two singers or bands. Favourite singers? Uh, music's quite varied uh, between Springsteen, Stereophonics, I like Oasis, I like loads of stuff, yeah. Okay. Um, what about f- favourite actors? You've got a couple of favourite actors. Actors would be uh, De Niro, Robert De Niro, and maybe Sam DiCaprio. Okay. I like him as well. Nice, good answers. Obviously not De Niro in his comedy roles. In his serious ones. Do you know what? I actually, I actually really like him in the Dirty Grandpa. I think he was brought in there. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, who's your best friend? I spent, uh, I think we had to put one down. I've, I've got a lot of BPs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we had to pick one, to be honest. Okay. I think I would upset yeah. the other. 
<laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll get a hard time when you watch that if, if, if you don't pick the, the right one. Um, yeah. Biggest influence on your career? It'd be my dad, yeah. It'd be my dad. Uh, just that quiet, uh, calm influence at, at times there. And other times there, and, you know, he stepped in and gave me advice. Uh, when I was a kid at Dunfermline, he had an assistant manager up by the throat going to take his head off when he gave me a hard time at one of the games. And I thought my Dunfermline career was over before it started. Okay. Um, but my dad's always been the, the one there at you know, to give advice or take control of things. Yeah. Okay, last question. Which person in the world would you most like to meet? Uh, so this can be alive or dead. Alive or dead. I'd like to have met Maradona. Yeah. Good show. Was... Okay, brilliant. That's, that's the questions. Um, Tom, any questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Obviously, you're uh, promoting your book just now, Jackie. Why now? To write your write your story. Uh, well, I th- I'd been asked a number of times to do it over the years, and I didn't think for for one to do it while I was managing or playing. I don't think it'd be right. Um, and obviously, what happened to me last year, um, you know, I thought it would be good to put that out because a lot of people would contact me and ask me certain things, or you know, it's happened to one of their family, and you know, and hopefully somebody reading it can actually it can help them you know especially with the recovery and what to expect with that and time scales and when you think you've you get no hope in life to, to kind of recover and uh, how you handle it so yeah I think it's I really enjoyed doing it to be honest you know I've I've not held back in anything that obviously people have a, a perception of me as a player and manager and different things in my career um, laterally obviously the management side uh, dealing with stuff at York uh, Dundee United before I left my contract having to handle all that um, was tough you know and uh, so I, it was just a way of, of um, just seeing my side of things which you don't always get to hear uh, so like people decide for themselves when they read it And what was the, the process like um, writing it with, with Jerry McDade? It was really enjoyed it, you know. Some bits were really tough, as I said, when we were doing it. I had kind of really emotional uh, doing it, you know. Obviously, talking about certain parts of it, and I lost. I said I lost my mother just after Seville in two thousand three. Um, that was really difficult to to deal with, and still keep playing and carry on as if everything was normal. Um, so, yeah, it was. It just kind of. I really enjoyed doing it with Jerry, but some bits were, were tough on others. And then obviously going back over the stuff in the hospital and coming round and the things I experienced and uh, even just with the coma. Uh, you know, I always thought when I came out and starting to recover that it was the, the drugs I'd give you to, and it was hallucinating and stuff. And I was like, well, I remember being in the coma. I remember pushing out the coma. And when I watched them, programs on it and they tell you that you're in a coma you don't uh, hear or see or do anything you switch kind of off so it was pretty spooky to hear that um you know it was a documentary on netflix called uh, surviving death and i watched that and it kind of there's a lot of things that i relate relate to when i was in the coma and seen and heard so quite spooky wow and just to touch on a couple of the people you worked with was there a moment, Jackie, on the field or on the training ground where you looked at Henrik Larson and realised, ah, this guy's different class? Yeah, probably every every day. <laughs> no, I think, see, when he first came, he's just one of the guys that, you know, uh, just get better and better. It seemed like even when he first came over, you know, he was playing golf, he wasn't great at golf. But you won fast forward six months and he's down to like single figures. It was just really annoying. <laughs> but you know, it was no surprise to me because he's but he's his desire, his attributes, his finishing, his calmness, but he's he's timing for everything. You know, he was a great he wasn't the biggest Henrik by any means, but the amount of headers he scored just by his movement. He was so clever, um, and such a, a gifted footballer. And uh what was what was Tommy Burns like for you as a, as a manager? 
Tommy was was unbelievable for me as a manager and as a kind of mentor. Um, I you know, talked about in my book with me and my wife had, uh, had a lot of problems there. We're trying to start a family and, uh, you know, that's the, the side there that it's not just the manager side, it's the human side. And he really, him and his wife, Rosemary, really helped us uh, deal with certain things. And, um, you know, we, we didn't think we could have children. You know, and Tommy, um, he, he done so much for us off the field as well as, as on it in the training field. So as a person, you give people different stories about Tommy, who, what a terrific man he was and manager, but he was, he was a, a real top, top man. Another wee thing I want to ask you, Jackie, I, I was quite intrigued when I heard that you'd written a, a sitcom. What was, what was, what was the thing behind that and how did you, how did you enjoy, how did you enjoy the process of doing that? I actually, I, I done it, um, when I was out injured at Arctic Thistle and I broke my leg just towards the tail end of my career before I started management. So I started spilling the stuff down, uh, just like funny stories, stuff I'd heard over the years, you know, and I had uh, a family friend in Frank Gohuli who was in Still Game. Um, he was in River City and different, and I'd, I'd met him at the shops and we just get chatting and, he actually helped me with certain things there. And we, we filmed a pilot uh, at Falkirk Stadium where and Gary Lewis played the manager. He uh, was another family friend. He read the script and with all these actors and actresses came along and I wanted to, to do it. Yeah, and it was it was brilliant. It was a great experience. And we'd written about seven episodes um, at the time. And... Again, this is before I started management, so the material that I've got since then is just, <laughs> it's, uh, I can imagine, but, uh, you know, I think as a player, you miss the dressing room banter and the funny stories and different characters with different afflictions and different things. So, you know, it was my way of putting maybe four or five characters into one person and telling a few stories with it. Um, but obviously it's still sitting there you know, not to be not to be seen for the public yet. Maybe, maybe they can they can um, use it to replace the only an excuse slot at New, uh, New Year. You know? Yeah, you never know. I mean, we had a we had a meeting. Me and Fan went to the, meet the guy in Angus, the BBC, uh, a few years ago. Um, he's not, I don't think he's there anymore. But you know, and they took us into the, the studio in the BBC in the glass room, and it was just the three of us in there. And he's like, you know, just to warn you before we start. Um, he says, I never laugh or smile. He says, don't, so don't, <laughs> don't take it the wrong way. I was like, it's the wrong job, mate. You know what I mean? Head of comedy. <laughs> so, um, for that side, I thought, uh, this is not, this is not going to be great. And, uh, obviously, he didn't take it any further. Maybe a bit too, uh, a bit OTT for him at that point. Hmm. Yeah, hand back to you, Andy. Hey, okay, yeah. I'm just going to go back into the magazine here. I want to look at this one article and then we'll jump to the article on your dad and we'll have a wee chat about that as well. There's an article here that says, New System, a winner in points. And the article says, The Football League's brave experiment of three points for a win is receiving a mixed reaction from managers and administrators. The initiative has been hailed as putting entertainment back in the game. Fulham manager Malcolm McDonald is not a big fan. Laurie McMenny of Southampton says that the impact can already be seen with teams less noted for attacking having a lower position than they might have used to. Now, England was the first nation to introduce this, and it took until 1994 for it to be introduced in Scotland. And it was first proposed by Jimmy Hill and first used in the World Cup in 1994 as well. You forget about things like this. I mean, this is 1981. England are three points for a win, and it took another 13 years for Scotland. Presumably after, because the 1994 World Cup went with it and then everybody started going we better go with it. It, it. it really, really shocked me when I found out it was 1994. You just assume it, it's been a lot um, longer than that. I actually thought it was the year after we'd done it. I always thought it was... Um, f- ah, sorry, it was because I went to... It was uh, 95 to Celtic. Um, you know, and that was kind of changing there. I'd spell it confirming and it... It did make a big difference in it, the, the extra extra point. Mm. There's the results here, just a quick scan across the results, uh, lineups, results, scorers. Uh, Scottish Premier, we've got Aberdeen 2, Dundee 1. 
Airdrie 1, Partick 1, Dundee United 0, Samirin 2, 2 goals by Jimmy Bone. Hibs 1, Celtic 0, uh, Alan McLeod penalty, and your dad's in there, I think, yep, he's in there, MacArthur, Snedden, Turnbull, Patterson, McNamara, Callaghan, um, was that Flavo, Ray, Murray, and McLeod, and Duncan. And Rangers drew 1-1 one, one with Morton. Scottish First Division, we've got Clay Bank, East Stirling, with a, a, a really, probably the most exciting game of the day, and a 0-0 draw in front of 500 people. Um, who else have we got? We've got um, Air United 1, Dunfermline 1, um, there as well. Any other scores anybody want to pick out? So, so the Scottish League Cup is also there, which was from Wednesday, 28th October. And Aberdeen 0, Dundee United 3, United 1, 3, 1 in aggregate. So there's uh, Sturrock with 2 and Ralph Milne with the other goal. And Rangers 2, St Mirren 1, a Jim Beck penalty and a John McDonald goal for Rangers. While Ian Scanlon with a penalty for Saints. And Rangers went through 4, 3 on aggregate. So again, it's always great to look back at the these old games, just look at the players and um, you know the, the tendencies and things like that. Um, so that, that's always nice to do that. So we'll just move on to, we've got a few pages here. So we're moving on to McNamara at Thrill by Douglas compa um, Comparison. So there's two articles, there's actually two articles in this page, so we'll take this one first. Um, so it says, another Kenny Douglas, that was the verdict on the young midfield man who was breaking into the Celtic team, the Celtic first team alongside Kenny Douglas in the early 70s. Jackie, who's now at Hibs, says, that seems a long time ago. Kenny was a favourite of mine and it was a great thrill to line up alongside him for Celtic. I played with him many times in the attack and his skills were always something special. When I heard that some fans thought I had some of the same talents, I was flattered. Um, today, McNamara is one of the most skillful sweepers in the Premier Division. Hibs haven't enjoyed the best of seasons lately, being relegated two years ago. High expectations were set after an epic Scottish Cup final with Rangers that ran over three games before being decided by an Arthur Duncan own goal. Hibs were relegated the following season, but have got themselves back into the top league and are currently near the top of the table. So in this season, Hibs would finish in 6th place on 36 points. And they finished bottom of their Scottish League Cup group with St Mirren Celtic and St Johnson and knocked out of the Scottish Cup after a re replay with Dundee United. So not, not, not a great season. So, so talk about um, what was it like having such a... A, you know, a famous footballer as a dad and obviously the comparisons between yourself and him as you were growing up Yeah it was um, obviously when we, me and my two brothers I was a middle child um, we, we, my mum would take us to all the games and and Hibs fans used to sing his name there's only one McNamara you know it was and you always think hey, your, your dad's the best player in the world yeah. um, and you know, I've the bias to there, but I thought he was he was good. You know, he played in the sweet pearl. Hibbs actually saved his career and he talked about that. You know, I think my dad was was quite young, he had a, a cushion ligament, which at that time was career career ending. Um, but you know, Hibbs got him back and they good to spell there at Hibbs and he absolutely loved it. So um for me, obviously starting out with the comparisons was tough when you when you when I was younger, you know, people saw he's only there kind of that, such and such. Um in some ways you've got to, I felt I had to do even more because of that, you know, to prove myself and prove that I was there on merit, not because my dad was who he was. So, so how, how did he, I take it he encouraged you in the game as well, it wasn't, you know, he didn't try and talk you out of it or anything like that, was was that the situation? No, yeah, he was yeah. just the right advice and how to handle certain situations and, um, you know, I think that, that really helped me. My, my older brother played a little bit, but he wasn't really as keen to be a professional like myself, but your younger brother didn't play. But um, for me, I didn't know what to do and... You know, I used to be a ball boy at Hibs as well, me and my older brother, and I just wanted to be on that pitch, you know, the, being so close to it and the game, it's, it's always what I wanted to do. Yeah. So so your dad's career, it started at Celtic, um, the Hibs, and then, as you say, Morton. Did, did he play at Hamilton, or was he coaching at Hamilton? He was, I'm not sure if he actually played any games, but he was just a manager for a spell as well, but I'm, I'm not sure if he actually played for Hamilton. Um, 
But I do remember him playing for Morton yeah, quite a number of times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've got 57 league appearances for that, 236 for Hibs, and 26, 21 for Celtic. But these are just yeah. league appearances. But um, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's certainly. I I come across quite a lot of the the articles about your dad, and then you know, when I post them online, things like that there certainly is a lot of a lot of love for him from even from from Celtic um, fans as well. And I guess. You know, he was there for a few years, but he didn't really, you know, 21 first-team appearances. So, you know, to have made an impact with so mm-hmm. few games is, is, is probably quite a, a good indicator of how, how good a player he was. Yeah, and he's come in at the, the tail end of the, the Lisbon Lions era as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, the team that they had that he was, he was trying to break into was, wasn't easy. Um, but as I said, he, he did pick up a, a bad injury there and... Uh, get swapped in a swap with Pat Stanton went the other way, um, but no, he, he loved his time at Hibs. I mean, that was where he enjoyed his football the most. Mm-hmm. Now, so on the same page. So, just wait to say we have the article on your dad there, and then there's one about Sandy Clark. So, we'll have a quick chat about that one. And it says priceless Clark and every manager Bobby Watson has said that striker Sandy Clark is absolutely priceless in today's transfer market. Clark nearly moved to Partick Thistle the season before for £100,000, but when Thistle's hopes of confirming a place in the UEFA Cup were dashed by a bad result on the day of the move was to take place, the deal fell through. Clark has also attracted the attention of Aberdeen's Alex Ferguson. And Clark says, I'm no, not in any rush to leave Broomfield. The club has been good to me, and I hope I've been good for it. I just want to keep knocking in the goals to show everyone what I'm capable of. Now, this season... Airdrie finished bottom of the league and were relegated and despite this Clark won the PFA player of the year for the season which is some going for a relegated team he was at Airdrie he moved down south to West Ham United didn't really work out from there moved back to Rangers um, Hart of Midlothian Partick Thistle and 1990 had four games at Dunfermline Athletic as well then went on to manage Thistle Hearts, Hamilton, St Johnson, and Berwick Rangers. I believe he's currently at Queen of the South with Alan Johnson. I think he's fought yeah. there, followed yeah. about a few times. Um, have, mm-hmm. Much have you had many dealings with Sandy Clark? Yeah, I worked with Sandy when uh, at that spell at Aberdeen with the two Jimmies. Yeah. Uh, Sandy was there working with them as well. Um, his son, his son was on the uh, Nicky, who's at Dundee United, he was he was there as well on the ground staff. Um, we've done him well, well for himself over the years so mm. yeah um, it was a decent moves at Sandy and quite an effective player yeah striker excellent so we're at the back of the magazine so let's just have a wee look at that so this is um, super focus on Mark Lawrence and Liverpool's Mark Lawrence and the, the happy man of football so a couple of the, the things just to, to focus on so other sports person you most admire and his answer is amateur sportsmen who take part in sport purely for the love of it. Now that's not an answer that I would have expected from Matt Lawrence, who's notoriously quite a, a doer. You know, and there's people question that he even likes football. Um, and I have to admit, <laughs> I've, I've 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 been in that camp a few times myself. But yeah, he says that the pe- people he most admire are amateur sports people who take part in sport purely for the love of it. Uh, Favorite food and drinks: lasagna and lambrusco. Is that something that you would be interested in? A combination of lasagna and lambrusco? Uh, the lasagna's fine. Yeah. The lasagna's yeah. fine, absolutely. <laughs> um, most like to meet the Princess of Wales, he'd most like to meet as well in there. So, yeah, the rest mm-hmm. of it's all just sort of um, stock answers. Um, Favourite holiday, Dallas, Texas, film scene, Raiders of the Lost Art, things like that. So, so we've got to the end of the magazine, Jackie. Um, thanks for going through that with us. Um, now, in terms of the book, where where can people get a hold of this? Um, it's a it released today. Um, a book, was it today? It was released. Yeah. Uh, no, it's actually out on Monday, so you'll get it in uh, most bookstores. I'd imagine W H Smith uh, as well, um, Watson's, uh, Amazon. You know, about about Monday. What, what's it called? Is it My Name Is Mac McNamara? Or? His name is Matt Newman, yeah, it's off the, the song. Um, I was actually going to call it to Holland back um, because when I went to the hospital, with, you know, when I my aneurysm, when yeah. I pushed to the whole hospital, and also the, the, the surgeon that done the 
my procedure was called Aubrey. Right. Who was anybody who watches Fools and Horses know Aubrey was Boyce's right. first name. So right. um, you know, little things like that. Mm. Uh, remember at the time when he was telling me his, who his, his, his full name and stuff, and was, you know, it yeah. was uh, good to deal with in comedy. Yeah. Are, you, are you still are you still down based down south? Are you down in York? Yeah, there? yeah. I mean, my wife uh, and one of my children, the other two children, are up in Scotland. But yeah, we're still based down there, and we uh, love about thirty minutes from from York itself in a little a little town, which is, is lovely. Yeah, I, to be honest, I'm, I mean, I, I've lived down in, so I lived down just near Leeds, and I've lived down here the last 21 years or something like that, so, you know, mm-hmm. I, I know the area quite well, so I, I think I know the sort of area that you're in, and it is, it's lovely, lovely country up yeah. there, and, um, I mean, York itself is a beautiful city, it's a beautiful it is, city. yeah, it is, it's a lovely, lovely city, nice, nice um, restaurants and uh, shops and bars there, and uh, you know a lot of, a lot of history mm, yeah absolutely and until it rains too heavily and then it gets a bit yeah, it floods. Yeah, so. <laughs> so the so the book's available on Monday and um, it's by is it who's publishing it it's Pitch Pitch Publishing pitch. yeah Pitch okay. Publishing so, yeah, so if, yeah. if, if people want they can go to the Pitch Publishing Pitch Publishing website and check out um, the best places to to, to buy it I'll, I'll be getting it myself as well so um, I'll have a wee read of that. And um, what is, is there anything else going on with you at the moment? Are you involved at Dunfermline again? No, no, um, I'm not doing that. Any, I was doing that uh, before, but it's, I think all changed there now with uh, German owners. And right. um, no, it was good. I, I really enjoyed this, uh, going in to try and help out um, earlier on because, as I said, I got a lot of affection for the club that mm-hmm. helped me. It gave me that chance to start my career, and it was a good grounding there at the film and the good people. Um, so, yeah. So for me now, it's mostly um, mostly just been watching watching games. Now it's good that the the fans are back. Now you can get in and watch more yeah. more football. Yeah. Well, so what what are your long term plans? Or do they have any at the moment Is it to get involved again at any sort of level? Uh, not immediate. I don't think my no. family would be too happy if I said yeah either. Um, you know, I think they suffer the most when you get uh, you're in that public eye and you get the abuse. Yeah. You know, they because they care and they worry about you and stuff. So um, I've got no, I've got no desire to to go back and do anything like that just now. Um, I don't think that that will change over the years. Oh. I miss playing football. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. If I could. Turn back the clock and go and play football again. I'd, I'd love to, but um, the management side, I don't, I don't really miss. So, are you, are you allowed to play in like sort of testimonials or little games like that, five aside? Is that something uh, you can do? Yeah, I mean, I've been back doing some running myself, trying to keep get myself into a better shape and um, and fitness. But uh, I've not played any any matches yet, mm. any testimonials or charity games. But yeah, hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to do that and. Um, just not head of the ball. Yeah. Well, listen. When you're at any sort of level of fitness, I'll I'll get the Clyde Bank manager to give you a shout, and you can come guess for us. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> listen, Jackie. Um, certainly wish you the best with with the book. I'll I'll we'll, um we'll certainly give it a good plug on the the Twitter account and the website and things like that. And wish you all the best for your health, especially more than anything else. Um, and thank you very much for going through the magazine with us. It's it's been. It's been really good, so thank you for your time. Oh, pleasure. Thank you very much. Nice, nice to be on. Thanks and, for having uh, it. Thank you very much. Cheers, Jackie. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. The charity partner this season is the West Dumbartonshire Community Food Share. This is a charitable organisation that provides various services and support to the local community, including the following. A school uniform bank, school holiday brunch bags, food provisions, Christmas toy bank, cooking and growing lessons and a baby bank. They provide essential support to the local community and supporting individuals and families and we will be looking to support them in any way we can through the podcast. This will include drives for donations of food, money and support in the form of volunteers. We will also be raising awareness of the group to highlight the work that they do but also to ensure that families and individuals who can benefit from the group are aware of these vital services. You can follow them on the West Dunbartonshire Community Food Share Group on Facebook 
or westdunbartonshirecommunityfoodshare.co.uk for the website. And that's West Dunbartonshire with an N. You can also donate through our Just Giving page for the charity at justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash shoot the breeze one word. Also keep an eye on our Twitter accounts at shoot tb underscore podcast and at Scott's Footy Cards for updates and news on our charity partner. We'd like to say a special thank you to Pete Wiley of the Mighty Wah for the use of the story of the blues in the music for our show. You can catch up with Pete on petewiley.co.uk where you can check out the details of upcoming gigs and new music. We'd also like to thank our producer Diane Jarden for her great work and support on the podcast. Please check out transmissionroom.co.uk where you can book music recording and rehearsal facilities in Clybank.